Good evening. Hello and welcome everybody who's joining us tonight for uh, this MHPN webinar, Collaborative Care for People Living with Ticks and Tourette Syndrome. I'm excited to have you all here. We have several hundred of you already joined and we're hoping to have perhaps over the 500 mark tonight. So thanks very much for joining on this Wednesday evening. Um, I'm Nicola Palfrey. I'm a clinical psychologist and researcher based in Canberra and I'm excited to listen to our esteemed panel this evening. Um, but before we get going, I would like to importantly um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am joining you from tonight, which is the Ngunnawal people here in Chile, Canberra. And of course, this week is NAIDOC week, so um, as important as it always is, it's even more important this week to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waterways across Australia on which our webinar presenters and participants are joining us from this evening. And I personally, and on behalf of our panellists, would like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and thank them for the memories, the traditions, the cultures, and acknowledge the hopes of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and of course, welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us tonight. So we have a really interesting and fascinating topic here tonight. Um, we've got a great panel to join us. We're not going to go through all of their bios because I want to hear from them and I'm sure you are keen to do that as well. Um, so we will get right into it. I'm going to introduce each of our panellists to start off with and I've got a little bit of a teaser question for them so we can get to hearing from them straight away. So first of all, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Tim Usherwood. Tim um, is coming to us as Emeritus Professor of General Practice at the University of Sydney and as a professorial fellow at the George Institute for Global Health. Um, Tim's coming with a number of hats tonight, um, two of which are as a general practitioner working in this space, but also has a lived experience of living with uh, Tourette syndrome. So welcome to you, Tim. It's lovely to have you here. I was wondering if I could start, um, Tim, by asking just briefly, if you could share a little bit about how, for you, has having Tourette syndrome influenced your development as a clinician in this space? Yes, thanks, Nicola. Well, I suppose I've been fortunate. Although the ticks have been fairly intrusive at times, they've never really prevented me achieving my career goals. It probably helps that I've never had coprolalia, and I acknowledge that some people's lives are far more affected by ticks than mine has been. What having ticks has done is to make me very aware of an othering attitude towards patients that can sometimes be found amongst medical practitioners and perhaps in other health professions. I'm a doctor and I live with a diagnosed neuropsychiatric disorder and they are both aspects of who I am. So I'm human, just like everyone else. Thank you, Tim. That's and I think it's so important to have those dual lenses coming tonight. So I'm really excited to hear as we, we go through tonight. Next of all, I would love to introduce you to uh, Associate Prof Professor, pardon me, Daryl Efron, who's a developmental paediatrician, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and coming with his expertise in this area. Daryl, you're conducting a fascinating study at the moment on medicinal cannabis usage for adolescents with severe Tourette syndrome. I was wondering if you can give us a little bit of a snapshot of that, that work that you're doing. Um, sure, I'm happy to. It feels funny to be starting with that, which is kind of experimental before we've covered basic things. But um, I'm interested in um, I went into Tourette syndrome, which I'll talk about soon amongst all developmental disorders. So I see lots of kids with um, various forms of neurodisability, intellectual disability, learning difficulties, autism, ADHD, and so on. And these disorders all overlap um, with each other. And many of the kids with those conditions have tics and vice versa, as we'll come on to this evening. Um, medicinal cannabis is, is a particular, is, is um, a, a, an area of interest that I've developed in over the past uh, five or six years. And uh, I'm conducting studies of a number of uh, conditions um, to see whether cannabis might be helpful. I've done a lot of work with other psychiatric medications in the past. Um, and the main study I'm doing actually is targeting severe behaviour problems in kids with intellectual disabilities and autism. Um, but we are doing a small um, pilot study at the moment uh, in kids, in adolescents with severe Tourette syndrome on the back of some evidence in adults um, out of Germany. Uh, suggesting that um, cannabis can be helpful in reducing ticks in adults. There hasn't been any research in kids so far, so we're starting to do that. 
That's great. I should imagine that. Topic for another another webinar, maybe. Um, thank you, Daryl, and I will throw to you in a little bit. But finally, I would love to introduce Professor Valsama Epen, who's a child psychiatrist, um, and coming into this area with her expertise on um, Tics and Tourette syndrome. To begin with, uh, Valsa, I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of your insight that Tourette syndrome is often underdiagnosed. Um, do you have any views on why that may be? Yes, it is true that it is um, very much underdiagnosed, um, partly because it has got a, a milder onset when it comes on as a blink or a twitch, and parents might take them to a um, GP, for example, or to somebody else. And depending on what answer they get, they may never go back even when things get worse. For example, if you had a little bit of blinking and a twitching and then you went to the GP or to another professional or pediatrician and got told that, oh, that's okay, that's kind of something that kids do and they grow out of it. Even when things get worse or other comorbidities start to occur, they would think, oh, that's something that the doctor said is okay, you don't need to do anything further. That's one, one way in which it's uh, uh, not diagnosed. Another way is that sometimes um, it's not so much the ticks that come to the attention. It may be that fidgetiness or um, the disruptiveness of making silly noises, for example, and you get told off or you kind of said, you know, stop doing that. And and people don't even recognize. If you don't know it, you, you don't know it. And therefore, even health professionals wouldn't pick it up sometimes if they went for obsessive compulsive behaviors mm. and when, or, or the went for ADHD, for example, because that's the kind of the thing that people pick up and either the teacher or somebody else says, oh, yeah, you want to get checked out for that. But the, they will be twitching and, and doing all those things. And, and because you're not very much aware of it or you're not, not on the front of your mind, you, you really don't pay much attention to it and time and time again, all of those are missed cases. So when yeah. they present with comorbidities, present with things that uh, initially are, are ignored, uh, et cetera. So there are a number of reasons why, yeah, it's underdiagnosed. That's great. Thank you. So that's the importance of tonight, the differential diagnosis, but also the um, moment in time versus that kind of checking on things over time. That's great. I'm so excited to hear what you guys have to say. So we've got over 440 people joining us tonight, which is a wonderful result. So um, I'm sure they're going to get a wealth of information tonight. But without further ado, if there's no other major issues, we should get into it. We have learning outcomes that we can go through very briefly, but basically the panellists tonight will take us through an understanding of ticks and Tourette's, um, how they may manifest, how we can work with them, what the um, different approaches to treatment and outcomes are for people impacted as well as the, the families that support them. So let's get going. I think with um, we had a case study that we'll refer to as we go along tonight. Some of the panellists will refer to it in their first talk, but we'll also address it again in the Q&A as we go along. So you all should have received that as we go along. So without further ado, I'm going to throw over to Tim to hear from his perspective on tonight's webinar. So over to you. Thanks, Tim. Sorry, I'm muted. Thanks, Nicola. And can I have the first slide, please? Thank you very much. So. Um, okay, so thanks again, Nicola, and good evening, everyone. I'm a general practitioner and a researcher and a university teacher. That's me with my children at the end of the Hefe track, a five-day walk in New Zealand. My first memory of ticking was repeatedly grunting in my primary school classroom, much to the irritation of my teacher and the amusement of my classmates. Some weeks later, I saw my father wrinkle up his nose in response to an unpleasant smell. My grunting gave, round, gave way to nose wrinkling. Over time, I acquired new ticks and lost earlier ones. They became more complex, often combined, combining grunting with other movements, and mainly affecting my face, neck, shoulders, and arms. Inevitably, my nickname at school was Twitch. Although I saw several doctors and a child psychologist, I remained without a diagnosis until I was at university. In my third year of medicine, I asked our psychiat psychiatry lecturer if he could explain the cause of my tics. He referred me to a neurologist, and it was an enormous relief when I received the diagnosis of Tourette syndrome, 
of which I had not heard at that point. But at last I had a reason, a diagnosis, and a way of talking about my symptoms. I'm now 68. My tendency to tick has reduced markedly over the last couple of decades, but it is still present when I feel stressed, and you may notice the occasional tick this evening. Fatigue and mental concentration can ex exacerbate their frequency. Listening to music and physical activity both reduce the urges. Next slide, please. At times, the ticks are socially embarrassing, but they've also been the source of shared amusement. I've never experienced coprolalia, but I am aware of a temptation to copy the verbal and non-verbal ticks of others. Occasionally, I have left a room to avoid catching a tick from another person with Tourette's. Tourette's syndrome is well known to be associated with a range of other conditions, including ADHD, OCD, poor impulse control, and other behavioral problems. I don't make, meet diagnostic criteria of these conditions, but I do tend to be somewhat obsessional, which is perhaps not a bad trade for a physician. I also have difficulty concentrating on a single task for a prolonged period. I'm usually reading several novels and other books concurrently, a few pages from each at a time. General practice suits me as a specialty, as clinics typically present a diverse and varied range of patients and problems. The condition hasn't impacted much on my family, although, although my mother found my tics frustrating at times, and I think felt guiltily that she was in some way responsible. My children are mainly amused by my obsessional inability to leave the house without going back to check that I've locked the front door properly. I've been fortunate in this respect, and I recognize that many people living with Tourette's syndrome and its comorbidities experience much greater impact on their lives and their families. Next slide, please. So what have I needed from my health professionals over the years? Receiving a definitive diagnosis and an explanation of the condition were enormously helpful, and they gave me a way of talking to others about my tics. Tourette's main impact on me has been as a social of social, cause of social embarrassment. I could have done with advice on strategies for coping, especially as a teenager and young adult. For many years, I hoped for a cure, or at least for treatment to reduce the ticking. But a trial was, of haloperidol was unpleasant and put me off the idea. What I have found most helpful is self-acceptance. I don't particularly like having Tourette's syndrome, but it's a part of who I am, like my eye colour. Next slide, please. It's worth remembering that Tourette's syndrome is chronic, affects the patients and their family in different ways at different life stages, and generally requires a multidisciplinary approach to care. The patient themselves has to manage their own condition, hopefully with support from family and friends. Well-informed teachers are important, as is a regular general practitioner who can advise, advocate for the patient, and coordinate their care on an ongoing basis. Definitive diagnosis may require input from another specialist, such as a paediatrician, urologist, or psychiatrist. And for many patients, mental health expertise is likely to be needed in providing psychological and behavioral therapy. Daryl and Balser are going to say more about this. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I'm really interested to unpack some of that a bit further with you as we go along. But for now, I will hand over to Daryl. Thanks very much, Daryl. Thanks, Nicola. Good evening, everyone. Um, and nice to be part of this uh, webinar this evening. Um, really interesting to hear Tim's story of, of his lived experience. Uh, and in fact, um, many of the points that I'm going to make from a pediatrician's perspective um, will be picking up on, on threads that Tim's already started to spin. Um, so we're not going to give a textbook overview of Tourette's here by any means, um, but it's a fascinating condition um, from a pediatrician's perspective because it's so um, complex and multifaceted. But from the patient's perspective, um, it's incredibly frustrating, and Tim used that word uh, as a... As a as a patient or a person with Tourette's syndrome, um, for many reasons, um, you know, the, the symptoms themselves, which, which I'll talk about, are incredibly um, frustrating when they happen, but they, the, the cause runs a waxing and waning course. So there are periods where kids 
uh, seem to be much better and then usually for no rhyme or reason they get worse again, sometimes for a good reason, a change of teacher or something happens in the family and there's an obvious stressor that means they get worse again, but very often they just wax and wane and fluctuate in severity and intensity for no good reason, which, which is really, really difficult to live with. So Tourette's was first described by Gil de la, Tourette, de la Tourette, a Frenchman in the late 19th century. And um, the history is really interesting if anyone wants to read about it. But um, at the time, it was mostly thought uh, to be a manifestation of hysteria, is my understanding. Uh, mostly, um, yeah, had, had a sort of a psychodynamic understanding. But we've come a long way and we now understand it to be basically a, a neurobiological disorder, of course, with, with um, psycho psychological uh, contributions. Next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to pick up uh, a few points and we can touch on other things during discussion uh, in response to questions. So when I was training, I was taught that lots of kids have tics and they're pretty much harmless, don't worry about them. Um, they can annoy parents and teachers sometimes, but they don't cause too much trouble. That's actually probably true. Simple motor tics are common in primary school age kids and generally are relatively harmless. Um, but Tourette syndrome, where you've got persistent motor and vocal tics causing impairment across settings lasting more than 12 months, that's sort of a DSM definition, and not always harmless at all. So they can be um, quite intrusive. They can interfere with functions like using a keyboard or even walking and talking at the severe end of the spectrum. They can be very distracting. Uh, in addition to intrinsic problems kids might have with concentration, the ticks themselves can distract. As Kim has mentioned, they can be embarrassing and stigmatising and sometimes can cause social isolation. Although I would have to say I'm always impressed by how more often um, how understanding peers can be um, at school, but not always. And they can be quite demoralising for kids and this can lead to secondary acting out uh, and even self-harm and depression. Uh, sometimes they can be painful, either the tics themselves can be painful or efforts to camouflage or suppress the tics with sustained muscle contraction can cause things like a sore neck. Uh, and, the, and the effort to suppress them, even if it's largely subconscious during the school day, which is very common, kids often don't tick much less at school than they do at home, but that, that comes at a cost of a build-up of inattention and fatigue. And in extreme cases, uh, they can cause injury, and there are case reports, I mean, you do see this perioral excoriation, that's some kids who open their mouth very wide can get dry skin around the mouth, which can be quite sore, and there's been rare that real case reports of things like spinal cord injury or even retinal detachment from violent head and, and neck ticks. Next slide, please. Um, kids with Tourette syndrome, um, and I'm mostly speaking about kids, I, I'm less familiar with the adult world, um, um, but children and adolescents with Tourette syndrome more often than not have one or more comorbid or associated mental health comorbidities. The commonest ones are ADHD and obsessive compulsive behaviours, sometimes reaching threshold from compulsive disorder. Um, furthermore, a whole range of mental health and developmental disorders, almost any disorder you can think of, are more common in kids with Tourette's than um, control peers. So anxiety disorders, learning difficulties, uh, autism spectrum disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, um, and depression, and, and there are others I've probably left off the list. Next slide. So um, again, Tim touched on the importance of psychoeducation, fancy word for just you know, sharing information about the condition and its cause and its, its likely um, prognosis and natural history. And this is, uh, of all the conditions we see, I think in Tourette's syndrome, psychoeducation is probably the most powerful and important. It's, it's important in everything we do as physicians and health professionals, but I think in Tourette's it's particularly important and can really help with reducing stigma and um, self-esteem erosion that can come with Tourette. So just simple things like Tourette's is a neurobiological disorder um, based in abnormalities of the neurochemicals, which we don't fully understand. Um, uh, so and this is for the patient and the family and also for the school and other people involved in the child's life. 
Um, he can't help it. I say he because it's mostly boys, although, of course, girls can get Brett syndrome less commonly. Comorbidities that I've mentioned, management options, which I'll cover through, and the natural history, which I mentioned, which is, is of a waxing and waning cause, which usually starts to improve through the teenage years um, and sometimes goes away altogether, but not always, and sometimes persists to some extent in adult life. Um, amongst the Tourette community, there's the talk, there's, there's um, a term called the talk, which is when kids, and very bravely, often with the support of a parent, um, give a talk about their condition to the class. And the Tourette Syndrome Association of Australia has a template for this, which is very helpful. Um, and this, uh, not all kids want to do this or, or, or can do this, but for those that uh, want to and do, it can be a game changer, it can really, um, really help them get on with their lives and, that, and, and just, it just becomes a part of who they are. Everyone's got a quirk and that, that's the quirk for this kid. And as I said before, it's, it's amazing how accepting uh, peers can be of you know, what pretty unusual behaviour sometimes. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not a psychologist, but um, various forms of psychological intervention can be helpful for kids with Tourette's, more, more often actually targeting things like obsessive compulsive behaviours or, um, or anxiety disorders or sometimes depression. Uh, but there is a um, manualised um, in specific intervention called CBIT for ticks, Comprehensive Behavioural Intervention for ticks, which involves two main elements. Um, exposure with response prevention, which is about increasing tolerance of this premonitory urge, which um, ticks have an urge, some described differently by different um, people who have, have ticks, but some, something like an itch that needs to be scratched. Um, so tolerance of that is one part. And then habit reversal training, which is training the person to develop, when they feel the premonitory urge, to develop a competing response that's incompatible with the tick and less socially um, stigmatised. And it's been shown in studies to be better than supportive psychotherapy for children and adolescents over about age nine with correct syndrome. But the, the psychologist does need to be trained um, in this specific therapy. And importantly, you need uh, to have strong parental support. So you need a motivated family who are available to work um, with, the, with the child or teenager. Um, finally, a couple of comments about medication. Um, here, um, the, the general, gen, some general points. We would only, we don't usually use medication to treat ticks um, for reasons we were told touch on. So we would only consider it if the ticks are at least moderate severity or severe and really quite impairing. And if we are going to use medication, we don't necessarily always target just the tick. Sometimes we do if the ticks are really bad, but probably more often we look at the whole patient and what comorbidities they have, and we might try to choose a medication that treats um, both the ticks plus some other comorbidity, um, such as anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder, for example. Um, and we need to be aware of the, the, the sleep pattern and the attentional issues and so on in choosing the medication. Um, and we need to minimize, be careful to try to minimise side effects, of course, with any medication we use, but the ones that we can use in this condition do have a lot of side effects. So we try to keep doses low and monitor closely and, in fact, um, reduce and, or even stop the medication when an opportunity arises. Final slide, please. I think this is my last one. So I won't go into detail here. This, uh, my understanding is this is not really a medical audience, but... I think the point to take away is that about medications for ticks is they're not that good. Um, um, it's, and, and also it's hard to know because as I keep saying, it waxes and wanes anyway. The best time for me to see a patient with ticks is during a really bad period because then no matter what I do, things, are, things will get better and then they'll get worse again, then they'll get better again. Um, so these medications involved have been shown to be better than placebo in treating, but they're not amazing. Um, the main two categories, the first is called alpha agonists, that's things called clonidine or guanfacine, and they um, can have side effects, absolutely. They can affect mood, they can be sedating um, and so on, but um, usually reasonably well tolerated. Um, the best medicines to suppress ticks 
are the antipsychotics, but as you would know, these carry a high risk of significant side effects, um, including weight gain, which is very common, and, and a range of other metabolic side effects, and sometimes um, other things like neurological uh, symptoms and also sedation. So we don't use those lightly. Um, I mean, the patients that Dulcer and I see, we do use, uh, need to use these medications sometimes, but this is at the really severe end of the spectrum. Okay, I'll stop there and happy to come back during discussion. Perfect. Thank you, Daryl. Um, um, it's really interesting, I think, that, to know about the different levels of intervention. And I think I, I love your point about educating and, and actually, you know, what we can do around the child or young person's environment, you know, to, to get their peers and um, teachers and so forth aware of what's going on and that just what an inordinate difference that can make when kids have information and, and they're, they're incredibly accepting. I think sometimes we, we undervalue how, how willing kids are to take on information. And um, so, yeah, I love that as well as um, all the other gems in there. But I will pass now over to Volsa for her presentation. Thanks, Volsa. Thanks, and um, it's it's great to be doing this session with um, uh, a, a different type of um, experiences uh, in the mix. And so I'm going to take a child psychiatrist perspective, but I'm going to do a bit of myths busting. <laughs> so firstly, Tourette syndrome is rare, um, is, is one idea that floats around, that it's a bizarre curiosity, that it's so rare, that you know you would not see one in your practices sometimes, you get told. <laughs> and the other one is that ticks, all, all other ticks is Tourette's. Both are wrong. Prevalence of uh, Tourette's syndrome is about 1% in school-going children. Uh, but about that, about one in five children would have a tick or a twitch. They may have a blink or a twitching, but it doesn't last very long. That's called the developmental tricks or the transient ticks. That's 20%. But when you have got either motor ticks or vocal ticks, which have persisted for more than a year, that's about 2%. You call it chronic tick disorder. But when you have got multiple motor ticks and at least one vocal tick, which has been there for more than a year, you call it Tourette syndrome. So it doesn't take much to get that diagnosis. You don't need to have coprolalia, like Tim was saying, that you just have multiple motor tics, at least one. So if you take the example of Ali, um, the case that we had for today, blinking and squinting has been going on for more than a year. So that's multiple motor tics. And he has started grunting, which means he has got at least one vocal tic and has been there for more than a year. That's all what it takes um, for getting a diagnosis. But the severe and the persistent one is about 0.1%. The next one is ticks only occur in childhood and they grow out of it to an extent. Yes, they do get better. Um, sometimes we talk about a third, a third, a third, but a nuanced way of looking at it is 30 to 50% will have significant improvement as they hit adulthood. Somewhat better in 25%. Intensity may lessen, but it's there kind of 20%, but will be severe um, continuing into adulthood in 5%. The next one is ticks are limited to just the vocal and the motor ticks. Yes, they are the cardinal features, but many have got a number of associated features, which is what usually lands them in trouble or gives them the kind of the real distress and frustrations. Complex ticks like licking or spitting or kissing or inappropriate touching. Um, mental ticks like counting in your head or mental coprolalia, which is a worry about blurting out an obscenity and copying ticks that Tim talked about, they're often missed they're often under um, misunderstood. And in the case of Ali, it was pulling faces as a teacher. He was reprimanded for. It's really a complex multiple ticks of the face. And there he goes. He's got no answers to, to, to tell the teacher that he wasn't doing it deliberately. So what would he say? It's kind of enormously difficult for a young person to, to carry that, not knowing why they are doing it and why they are being kind of told or um, reprimanded. And that's what caused him distress and school refusal. It was not the ticks per se, but it was a reaction to it that caused him grief. And then the grunting, often it is the vocal ticks are called silly noises. They are disturbing the class. And, you know, so that's another one. Both the parents and the teachers and everybody around them get so frustrated with the noises they make. Again, Ali was told uh, to get to the um, to a doctor for the ADHD, not for the ticks. And it's very, very easy to miss. Um, when you're consulting a pediatrician because the teacher said that he's not concentrating. 
And the ticks is all about, or Tourette is about swearing. Um, that's a view, unfortunately, even held by health professionals. Um, but only a third of clinic patients have coprolalia or involuntary swearing. So that's not uh, one of the most common uh, things. Ticks are always present and noticeable, as um, Daryl said, they wax and wane. Uh, sometimes you go through a period for days or weeks or even months when it is florid, and the other time it's kind of hardly anything there. And there can be a lot of daily variability as well. When you are stressed or anxious or excited or tired, you might kind of come on a bit more than other times. And you may go through a full school day without much, and then you come back and you give way. That's because it's the urge to relief cycle, and you're kind of sitting on it, and then uh, that's at the expense of mounting in attention, and something has to to kind of give way. You can't sit on that kind of level of things forever. And the other thing is no, there is no treatment, or on the other hand, oh, you just take some medication and I'll fix it. The truth is somewhere in the middle. Next slide, please. So what do you do? Um, um, Daryl talked about the medication. About 40 to 60 percent would get reasonably good response from medication. But most of the time, you kind of weigh in the comorbidities or associated features to, to think about whether they need medication and what medication we use. For example, in Ali's case, it's both ADHD and tics. In those cases, we go with that um, alpha to agonist like the guanfacin and uh, clonidine because it can help both the ADHD and the tics. Um, while ticks per se that the psychotics are much more powerful and, and, and effective, when you have got the two uh, together, the ADHD and the ticks, you probably want to use something that can it can have a positive impact on both as your first line and then go into the next one. For example, in, tame, in the case of Ali, the teacher said to seek help for the ADHD. So if a parent goes to a pediatrician because the teacher suggested he may be having uh, ADHD, the ticks are going to be totally not in the priority area or nobody would be looking for it or you may not even kind of figure out um, in that consultation that he has got the squinting and the blinking and all of the other things. So the medication choice, there may be stimulants. I'm not saying that you cannot use stimulants, but sometimes it can make the ticks worse. And so it is very important to understand that this is in the context of ticks. And the same goes with OCD and ticks. If you understand that it's coming with a family of, from the family of tick spectrum of obsessive compulsive behaviors. And the clues might be that they are kind of concerned for symmetry. They have to do evening up. If you do something here, you have to do something there to make it even. Or you have to get things just right. They keep doing it until they get it just right. Only they know what it is. And so these are very critical clues that this may be from a tick family of obsessive compulsive behaviors. And there, your standard treatment with SSRIs alone may not be sufficient. So again, that comorbidity may dictate what medication and, and uh, you use there. You may need to add a neuroleptic as an adjunct with the SSRI in those uh, cases. Next slide, please. So coming to the behavioral methods of treatment, the comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks, a huge US study by NIMH, 38% showed significant improvement, 52% showed some improvement. But it's also to be borne in mind that there has to be significant motivation from the part of the person um, engaging in the treatment and also on the, on the support people, whether they are partners or family members, um, it's very important. Uh, and again, tick type sometimes is important. Vocal ticks may not be that amenable to CBIT as much as motor ticks. Um, and also the availability of clinicians or to do the, uh, the, the treatment becomes another thing. And manualized it is. Uh, so uh, those who have got uh, CBT type experience and they will be able to kind of pick up the manual and get the techniques. There are no cost workshops done by um, Center for Disease Control with the Tourette Syndrome Behavior Therapy Institute. We did a little bit of an, um, training for clinicians as part of a research project a while ago. We are hoping to do one again. I have put in the resources, the, the link for getting the manual. Um, you can buy it and parent workbooks can also be bought. Sometimes I say that even if the uh, behavioral methods of tre treatment didn't give you the therapeutic effectiveness that you're looking for, it can still have a, an important role to play. Because if you can think of a stressful situation where you're worried that you're going to tick and you're going to kind of make your, <laughs> your, your time really embarrassing, the ticks are going to get worse because you're stressed. But having these techniques in your toolkit 
pulling them out to tide over that situation can be effective significantly. So that comes into the part of that coping with and strategies to get you tied over those kind of uh, particular moments or situations. School work accommodations are important, psychoeducation, self-acceptance, as Tim said. And Tourette Syndrome Association, has, Association of Australia and the other countries have got a lot of resources available. They run camps. And so it's about accepting finding what works for you, just like what ticks you, <laughs> makes you tick. It's it's kind of what makes you better as well, understanding that and and, and managing um, the times when things are quiet and, and using certain times of the day or um, certain times of your life when things are quiet to kind of do other things. So it, it's, a, it's very much a, an evolving situation. People need to be very prepared for that unpredictability. And, and that's part of, part of a big part of... Um, coming to terms with it and accepting and managing or living with it. I think um, that's that's my last slide, I believe. Uh, am I correct? Yeah, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you all. That's so much information to take in um, as we're going through and I'm just been scanning the questions from registrations, um, but also as they're coming through. So if you do have questions, please, um, send them through and we will we will get through them. We've had a dozen or so so far for me to work through. So I will go through some of them um, as we work through because we do have a bit of time. Um, but I was wondering uh, if I could start with you, Tim, particularly in relation to the case study that um, Balsa has just been referring to slightly. I'm wondering from your perspective, both from a lived experience, but from the GP perspective as well, if you were to see this family, what, what do you think your approach to them might be or what sorts of things do you think they might need in those first instances when they're, when they're coming to you with these sorts of questions about what's going on for their family? Yes, thanks, Nicola. Um, so I think I'm going to put my GP hat on here, um, bearing in mind that you, know, you can never really spit that from who you are. But, um, so look, I think Ali and his parents and his mother or his parents should expect several things from their general practitioner. First up, true in every every health profession, listening to their story and validating Ali's experience. This is not Ali being Ali being difficult. This is not Ali being disruptive. This is Ali with a problem and he'd like some help with it. So listening to their story and validation. We know that Ali probably has Tourette syndrome, but he, his GP and his family don't actually know that yet. So it's important to consider and discuss potential alternative causes for his symptoms such as allergic rhinitis and or bullying at school or other problems. But given the likelihood that he does have a tick disorder and, uh, and likely Tourette's, given what we know about it, and also perhaps that he has ADHD, although we're not sure yet, it's probable that Ali would benefit from referral to a paediatrician or child psychiatrist for confirmation of his diagnosis and advice on management. Once the diagnosis of Tourette's syndrome is confirmed, then the GP has an ongoing important role as a readily accessible source of advice, uh, source of advice, advocacy, referral and coordination of Ali's care. And of course, she and her practice will continue to provide other aspects of Ali's primary health care as he grows and develops. Beautiful. Thank you, Tim. I'm just scanning as a response to that. There was a question that's come through. I'm just trying to see who it has come through from, uh, from Simone. And I'm on, this is probably either for Valsa or Daryl. Um, there's a question about who should I go to at a 14 year old child? Um, do I go to a pediatrician or do I go to a psychiatrist? I'm sure there's not a black or white answer, but I think there's some sense that there's varying um, recommendations. If I see a pediatrician at 14, is that appropriate for ongoing care? Am I better off going to a psychiatrist? Do either of you have a, a view on that? Maybe Daryl, you first, and then I'll see you might want to add. Sure. Well, look, um, uh, it, it's really interesting and it's different in different parts of the world. So um, there's quite a lot of us and there aren't many of them. So good luck trying to get an appointment with a child psychiatrist for almost anything. <laughs> I can't get my patients <laughs> who I'm worried about to see psychiatrists very, very easily either. Um, so, um, so look, I think either has a lot to offer um, a patient like Ali, but in practice in Australia, um, and I'm talking about um, 
you know, major urban centres, let alone regional centres, where psychiatrists are even thinner on the ground, um, it's much more likely that a paediatrician would be available to see the patient. And paediatricians uh, these days are very well trained. Your average general paediatrician um, is very well trained in the range of developmental, behavioural and, and quite uh, disorders, but also does a lot of mental health work. Um, and actually the, um, the bar for um, severity of mental health problems that paediatricians see is, is I think higher than most people would expect. We, carry, we see lots and lots of kids with very significant uh, anxiety, depression, Tourette's, OCD, et cetera. Um, not just people like me who have a particular interest, but paediatricians in the community all over Australia. Um, it's becoming really difficult for paediatricians, I must say, and particularly through the pandemic and into this year, that the number of referrals we're getting for kids um, with these sorts of problems is, is huge. I, I um, have a small private practice, a group private practice, and we, we like other practices, are finding it really, really difficult to fit kids in with waiting times blowing out. I don't say that to discourage people referring, but that's just the reality we're in Australia at the moment, particularly anxiety through the pandemic, as everyone would know, has absolutely gone through the roof in kids and teenagers. And fix interestingly, is, is one manifestation that's really, really increased a lot as well. So um, long-winded way of saying, very happy for these referrals to come to paediatricians, but unfortunately access at the moment is harder than usual. Thank you both. I'm just wondering if you wanted to add to that at all. If you had no, that, again, yeah, Daryl is quite right that it will be very difficult to, to to get a, a referral to see a child psychiatrist. But I would just add to that, um, when somebody has got significant comorbidities like obsessive compulsive features and uh, other things which are much more uh, needing help as well, um, then maybe you can kind of weigh up whether, uh, even if it's waiting a bit, um, you might want to go to the child psychiatry route. But that's not to say that immediately um, for somebody with 14 year old with ticks, you, you will have mm. much better luck in getting a pediatric appointment. Yeah. Mm. And Great. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to follow on. There's a question from Zoe that came through earlier and she said, asking to the panel generally, um, have you seen a rise in ticks in adolescent girls, often with comorbid anxiety and depression since COVID? And Daryl, I'm going to throw to you first off, it's kind of what you just alluded to then. So I'm guessing that yes is the is the answer. Yeah, thanks, Zoe. Um, we absolutely have, and it's been described around the world, and there's publications about this if you want to click the internet. It's been very interesting, and people are still struggling to understand what's going on. So ticks typically affect boys much more than girls, including Tourette syndrome, a ratio of about four to one in most series. Um, and usually start in the um, early primary school or even preschool period. Um, in contrast, the teenage girls that have been presenting since 2020, actually, since late 2020, this was first described. Uh, I mean, we always had a few, but um, in, in relatively large numbers, um, are um, about equal boys and girls or even more girls, perhaps. I'm not sure what the latest data shows, but very different gender ratio, at least 50-50, perhaps, perhaps higher in girls even. Um, and uh, the, the comorbidity pattern's a bit different, um, less likely to have had ADHD-type um, features and more likely to have had anxiety and depression. Um, and some of them are presenting for the first time in the teenage years, which is unusual in Tourette's syndrome. Uh, although some of them have had some sort of subclinical tics that haven't caused too much difficulty through the primary school years. Um, and they've almost always got a lot of anxiety uh, and they're almost always very severe at onset as well, really florid. Um, I think uh, Valsa made the point that tics usually emerge relatively subtly and creep up over a period of months or even years. Whereas in these cases, they're starting really florid. And the other feature is that they seem to be infective across social media and people might have heard about the TikTok phenomenon. Mm. Videos are being shared and, that, and within a school, there might be many girls who are ticking off each other, sometimes boys as well. So it's fascinating. There's, de there's a debate amongst experts as to whether this actually is Tourette syndrome or or what's called a functional neurological disorder. 
uh, in some ways it doesn't really matter. They need these kids are expressing uh, that they're struggling emotionally and they need help. But the only way it matters to some extent is that we tend to be a bit less, even I already said we try not to use meds very often in Tourette's. With these kids, oh, wow. we probably even have a higher threshold. In other words, we're less inclined to use meds, more likely to start with psychological therapies. But I'm interested in Bowser's yeah. perspective as well. Yeah, thank you. That's great. You ticked off a couple of questions there, Daryl, that are coming through around the distinction between functional neurological disorder and the, the TikTok ticks, for one of, one of a better word. Valsa, did you want to add anything to, to Errol's comments there? Uh, I think it is a heterogeneous group that's now coming up with that florid presentation uh, after puberty. And some of them would have had a predisposition, either family history, personal history of a few ticks here and there. But the, the driver here is that, and the anxiety um, and the disinhibition. So the, the combination of you're highly anxious and stressed and you want to channel that stress through something and you're channeling it through this physical forms because you've got that disinhibition as a, as a as a vulnerability or a risk already mm -hmm. in you so you 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 disinhibit and the stress comes um and and overwhelms you and that's why you get that sudden onset explosive um type of takes and mm -hmm. uh, in management you need to kind of consider that stress anxiety trigger mm -hmm. self-awareness and the working on the inhibitory um strategies will be critically important than you would do in a regular tick involuntary motor inhib disinhibition type yeah. of situation so it's i think that's re really fascinating both your comments around you know sometimes we get really hooked on what things are or are not you know what is the cause behind them for example versus what can we actually do to help people exist in a way that is less distressing for them and what, you know, skills we can help them develop. Yeah. And I think that's a yeah. really helpful way to think about it. And particularly for people who aren't experts in this space, but they might be working in a school or a, a, a allied health or a psychologist, social worker, working with kids with really, you know, distressing and, and, and uh, uh, interfering anxious symptoms, whatever that may be. We've got really good skills and things that we can do with that, but we can get sidetracked a little bit because we can be caught up that oh this is a tick I don't know how to deal with it so I think it's always good to look for those commonalities of what can be helpful which you've alluded to in, in your chat I think that's re really really helpful yeah um, Nicola I'll, I'll just add that we, we're just kind of working on something we are calling it the uh, IC bit which is the integrated cognitive behavioral intervention for ticks so just the behavioral you know motor response and that alone won't cut it so that cognitive mm. part and the awareness part and um that's very important to add on to these kids yeah or young yeah. people yeah yeah sure thank you it's going to switch tact for a little bit i've got a question for you tim if that's okay um from marguerite and she's asking are you aware of any consistent correspondences between a particular trigger eliciting a particular Tick, let's say that three times fast. For example, a particular thought or sensory trigger consistently is eliciting the same particular vocalisation. So is there patterns, I suppose, in what leads to what? So I, look, I can speak mainly from my own experience and my relatively limited number of patients who've had Tourette's over the years. Um, and maybe Val's or Darrell wants to add something to my answer. But the, the the interesting thing about ticks, as Daryl mentioned, is that is that they they fluctuate in severity, um, but they also change over time. And, and I mentioned that myself. And so, the the pattern of ticks that, that I had when I was sort of twenty, say, was different from the pattern that I had when I was fifteen, and changed again to the pattern of ticks that I had when I was twenty five. So it wasn't so much that. Um, and, and in terms of triggers, I wouldn't say there was a clear event trigger. It was more the circumstances. So, um, as I say, feeling stressed, feeling tired, um, uh, giving a presentation to almost 500 people on, <laughs> on my webinar. And I have been ticking slightly as we've been, as I've been listening and talking. You probably can't see it. Um, so, 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 so the the, the circumstances are, are the trigger rather than events generally, um, uh, and the um, uh, and as I say, the 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 the, um, 
the fall of the ticks um, does change over time, but that's over months or, or sometimes years rather than rather than being particular circumstances. So if I'm ticking in a particular way, or I have been ticking in a particular way, um, in one certain circumstances, that's the same group of ticks that I'll have as another time. I don't know whether Val saw or has Daryl has anything to add to that from their, their experience with patients. I think probably the question is referring to what we have described as stimulus-induced ticks. So very particular stimulus produces a particular type of tick. And there was uh, a little bit of that during the start of the COVID <laughs> with the sniffing and the cough and various things. So that stimulus was enough to trigger a, 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 tick, a, a tick attack or a bout of tick in people. So that's a very specific thing that uh, occurs in about uh, in our series from the UK, it was about five to seven percent. So it's it's something very specific that some people get it, experience. Thank you, Pastor Daryl. Did you have anything to add? No. Okay. Cool. Um, I've got a question in, that's come in the chat and the Q and A, um, and I will open it up to see who would like to take this one on. Um, they're keen to hear a little bit more about differentiating mental tics from OCD. Has anybody got any, uh, Daryl or Balsa, anyone want to take that on? Is there a, the differential diagnosis seems very tricky <laughs> to me. So is there particular characteristics that you'd be listening out for, for want of a better term, in terms of that distinction between OCD and mental tics? Do you want to go, Daryl? Uh, no, I think it's probably more your territory than mine. If I've got sure. anything to add after, I will. Uh -huh. So one of the things that we say to differentiate, it's not a hard and fast rule because some people have got both. The OCB linked to the, to the tick spectrum of behaviours and they have got the primary OCD as well. So no one is immune from each other. So what I'm saying uh, is more to do with differentiating um, for those who just have one type, yeah? Um, one thing is that usually in non-obsessive compulsive disorder, there is an obsession or a thought which you neutralize using the compulsion. So I feel like I'm contaminated. I'm, you know, I want to kind of get rid of that jam in my hand and therefore I wash. So there is a thought that's the obsessional thought and then you neutralize it using the compulsive behavior. In OCB associated with ticks and the mental um, thoughts, which kind of more as a compulsive tick, we call it, is that it's it's more about that suddenness rather than a, that process in which you kind of cognitively think about it and then you neutralize it. But it's more, um, much more quicker and much more uh, abrupt without that conscious thought process anywhere in the scene. And the second thing is that you're much less anxious Whereas in primary OCD, you get a lot more of anxiety. In ticks, you want to do it not because of anxiety, but more because you want to do it in a particular way or in, until you get it just right. It's almost like the urge tick. So you have got the urge to do it or have to do it until you get it just right. And that's what's driving it rather than the thought which is driving it. So it's almost like the urge tick. It's almost like it's driven by that wanting to get it just right or wanting to relieve that that thing uh, instead of an obsessional thought, which is um, what what is accompanying the, the compulsive behaviours in an OCD. Thank you, Valsa. Daryl, did you have anything to add to that? Um, look, my, my understanding of this territory is less sophisticated than Valsa's. Um, I found that really interesting, but I'd have to say, um, as I've had an interest in Tourette's um, over time, I'm learning more about how common um, intrusive cognitive um, urges are of different types uh, in kids with Tourette's syndrome. And, and, and they're often not something that the kid will talk about readily unless you give an opportunity to kind of strange, weird feelings and um, uh, you know, a very in tune parent will sometimes be able to elicit this from the teenager and then convey it to me in the consulting room. Um, but I'm sure this happens um, 
these sorts of really uncomfortable intrusive thought processes happen more than than, than I pick up on. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and and uh, yeah, they can sort of compound the the distress and confusion um, that that kids with Tourette's syndrome can experience. Thank you. I'm going to throw to you, Tim, for a sec. Um, yes. Okay. Valsa and Daryl are, are describing to me as a, you know, non-expert in this field, but as a psychologist work with, you know, lots of kids, is it requires an amazing level of ability to articulate actually what is going on to make some of these differentiations, you know, when you try to talk about our own thought processes or what things feel like, um, seems it could be take an enormous skill set individually to be able to do that. I'm wondering from from your point of view and in your experience, how easy is it to to kind of put words to some of these impulses or urges? It's, is that a real challenge for people, do you think? Uh, look, I think it is. Um, I think listening to Galsa and Daryl speaking is, is thought provoking for me. It makes me reflect on my own experience. Um, mm. I've certainly got better, I think, as I've got older and, at sort of understanding some of what's going on for me cognitively and emotionally, as well as in motor sense um, uh, and, and the reasons. And certainly I, I re- recognize that phenomenon of, of neutralizing obsessive thinking through compulsive behavior. Um, although that's not seen as a part of the rest. But that really leads me to another thought, which is that, um, and, and this is not my area, I'm, you know, I'm a non-expert looking in, but it strikes me that we have these diagnostic labels like OCD and ADHD and, and Tourette's, and, but th- th- those are artifacts. Those are artifacts of how we think about um, uh, how, how, how the mind works and, and how it how it may or may not behave in a, in a in the sort of way we want it to um, and 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 to some extent the individual person has features of one features of the other features of something else and then we have a set of diagnostic criteria that we apply and they are really helpful in terms of prognosis and get and and um, guiding therapy but you know, but it's but it's not a good idea to confuse useful knowledge with an understanding that deep understanding of the underlying pathophysiology yeah, it's fascinating. I think also the um, thing that's buzzing through my head as you're as you're speaking there, Tim, is just how much work people do, regardless of whatever they're managing, whether it's they're shy or whether or not they're managing ticks or whether or not they have I don't know a fear of heights. Everybody has an inordinate amount of strategies that they're not necessarily aware of that they've developed over the years to manage things. And I think what you're talking about as well is you know delving into that deep reservoir that people have, like listening to you all speak about, um, I see this a lot, you know, the notion that when people can control or suppress urges, whether it's to to behave because of tics or anxiety or, or whatever it may be, that can often lead to a notion that people are turning it on or turning it off for, for you know, and when, when people get adults get freaked out by things, they often get a bit more rigid. So I think that's a really interesting thing to think about as well is how much work people are doing. And I don't know that always as adult professionals, um, we're curious enough with kids about how much work they're doing to, to manage what they're what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, look, I think I think Valsa um, referred to that earlier. Mm. That the, the, the part of the impact is 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 the effort, both the physical mm. efforts, and I'm I'm aware of that. I've certainly had a problem with my neck, for example, where I've been sort of and 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 that sometimes you do try to do the tick just right. So I mean, when, mm. when I used to have a sort of throat clearing tick, it was somehow sometimes it was a I, mean, I could probably do it now actually. I said, <coughs> <clears throat> and sometimes one of those clearing noises is the right one and sometimes it isn't so i need to do it again so so mm. there's this slight overlap between between stereotypical um obsessional behavior or compulsive behavior and um and and stereotypical tics and and I, I i just worry a little bit that we can't explain things through historical um uh, nosology um that's um that it's they're useful categories, but ultimately, as I'm sure we do, we treat the person, not not the 
not the disease label. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, the couple of questions around prevalence of adult onset ticks. Um, so two, a double bang question. Um, one is how prevalent is adult onset? And I know we might've talked about that earlier, but a reminder would be great. And is there a notion that the resolving with age is just getting people, people getting better at managing it? Or do we think they, it's actually their less present? Daryl, do you want to start with that one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I can say absolutely nothing about that. Sorry. <laughs> Only three kids. <laughs> I thought yeah. that just before I said it to you. I'm sorry. Yeah. So Nicola, the question is about the adult onset first. Um, you know, by definition, Tourette syndrome is, or tick disorders is um, to be having an onset during the developmental years before okay. the age of 18. Mm -hmm. So, but we do have um, uh, kind of we all have described uh, patients who present later in in life with tick like uh, symptoms. We call it late onset ticks, um, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the primary tick disorder. So there is a okay. differentiation to be made, and usually you get a, a reason for that. It, sometimes it's a, um, a kind of a carbon monoxide poisoning. I've seen. Um, you know, mild stroke of the basal ganglia area, sometimes infectious causes, you know, all kinds of things, but it's a secondary tick. And okay. so adult ones by definition are not the primary one that we are talking about here. And secondly, what happens over time and with adult life is that um, we all have got a lot of premonitory, you know, neurophysiological stuff happening behind the scenes in our brains, but we don't get to appreciate or recognize, experience it because we have got a very strong, what's called a sensory motor gating mechanism. And when that gating mechanism is not working very well, the hypothesis is that um, you get that leaking of the premonitory urge into conscious awareness, and then you kind of compensate that with the, uh, with the motor action with this, the tick and the urge tick relief cycle goes on. But during development and the brain matures, there's an opportunity for compensatory circuitry to kind of overcome that. And so that you don't, you know, you, you get the experience still, um, but you, you have found a way to not respond to it in the way that you would have done earlier on. Okay. And, and we believe that that maturation of the brain is what helps with the increasing age. And mm -hmm. in neurophysiological studies, what has been found is that that pre-pulse inhibition deficit stays on, even for those whom you, you think that, you know, they've become much better. So that primary issue is there, but your compensatory mechanism okay. will not necessarily conscious ones, but even mm. at brain the maturational level and the circuitry level, the compensatory circuitry come alive. And we believe that the comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks may be giving a helping hand to those maturation, because what you're saying is that every time you get there, you don't need to take, you, you kind of abort that cycle mm. and thereby kind of make the inhibitory circuitry to become much more alive and support you to not do the tick. And you may be giving a helping hand to okay. normally what would happen in the maturation of the brain. So is that a lot of people, I think, listening who are familiar in other areas around blame, brain plasticity and so forth, that's tapping into some of that notion. You can teach an old dog new tricks. You know, if we practice things enough, we can, um, you know, rewire the brain or, or build up the muscle circuitry in our brain to help those things. That's really interesting. The, I'm going to have one last question before we, we need to get a wrap up from each of you. Um, there's been a lot of questions that I think you have covered around the, the intersection between some of the other com comorbidities. One of the questions that's come through quite a bit in the pre-registration questions is about any evidence around association between childhood trauma and ticks and Tourette's. Is there any evidence about an association between the two? Daryl, have you seen anything with relation uh, to that? No, look, I don't know the literature on that. Um, um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if if um, if someone studied it well, it wouldn't be an easy thing to study mm. um, if there was some degree of association. Although we need to be careful. Most kids with Tourette's have not had any more trauma than anybody else. I think the word trauma is being used very loosely these days. Mm. We all have trauma. 
Um, so it depends what people mean by that. But yeah, I think it's important to recognise that it is a neurobiological condition and most kids um, haven't had more trauma than anyone else, but possibly it could be a manifestation of severe trauma. Um, uh, I, I think it's, I think, you know, have I in my clinical experience seen kids who've had trauma and, and have ticks, mm -hmm. of course, because both, both are relatively common in my practice, but yeah. the association's hard to tease about. I'm interested in others' perspectives on that. You think the differentiation will be hard as well, given the comorbidities in the association between complex trauma and all the other comorbidities as well, mm -hmm. such as OCD mm -hmm. and ADHD and so forth. But yeah. always a question that comes up. Go to Tim, please. Yeah, thanks, Nicola. I, I think it's worth adding that whatever the epidemiology, um, it is something that parents worry about. I know my mother worried about it, and I know mm -hmm. that um, other parent, patients that I've had who've had tick disorders or some of the other comorbidity disorders, it is a real anxiety that parents have. That, that something they, that had happened they, has they, led they, to this. They might be responsible. Mm -hmm. Something yeah. they either did or allowed to happen may have mm -hmm. led to this. So it's probably a topic that needs to be discussed at some point in the kid. Mm -hmm. not, not, not perhaps first up, but it's, it's certainly a, a topic worth raising at some points in, in the relationship with a with a, such a family. I think that I think it's a really good point. It's the unasked questions sometimes, isn't it? That that can be really um, helpful. You know, we get trained to say other people have questions or other people have raised this question with me, which can be a, a general way of of giving people permission to ask things that they might feel really quite nervous about, but are, are carrying a lot of concern about. I wonder if some people have told me that. Yeah. You know, those sorts of indirect <laughs> questions really, really valuable. Beautiful. We could talk for hours. It's 8.22 already. Um, so I'm going to ask all of you if you had a couple of um, wrapping up points or things that you wish you'd covered that you hadn't or, or summary takeaways for the audience tonight, um, what they would be. And I might follow the same order. So maybe for you, Tim, if you have any concluding thoughts for our um, audience yeah. joining tonight. Thanks, Nicola. Yeah, look, I think as we've discussed, Tourette's syndrome can be disruptive, but it's also a part of who the person is. Treatment can help, but so can self-acceptance and education for others. And it's worth remembering that many notable people have had Tourette's, including David Beckham, the footballer, Sam Johnson, the 18th century polymath, and Mozart, the composer. Beautiful. I love that. Thank you so much, Tim. Daryl, some concluding thoughts from you. Uh, my main thought is I wish we had more time. I'm really enjoying this discussion <laughs> and uh, great questions coming through and I'm learning a lot. So, um, uh, but what could I pick out? I think I'd like to go back to the territory we were in a few minutes ago. I think Tim was leading this idea of um, the, the um, utility of diagnostic categories. I mean, and, and, you know, we talk about Tourette's tonight, but as we keep saying, these disorders tend to uh, overlap and intermingle and travel together. Um, and I'm less interested in whether kids meet diagnostic uh, criteria for disorders rather than what they're experiencing, which is a thread that I think we've all been talking about tonight. So questions that I find useful and, and I teach and encourage the paediatric trainees to ask is, you know, just starting with, Norm, um, you know, everyday language, like what's difficult for you? What do you find difficult uh, directly to the kid? Most of the time, even relatively young kids. Mm -hmm. And then if they can find some words to describe it, really trying to um, interrogate it. What's that like for you? Interrogate in a gentle way, of course. What, what does it feel like? You know, yeah. you don't like having ticks or you find it hard to concentrate or you get stressed about going to school. What does it, what's, what's that like? What does it feel like? Try and get some inkling of what they're experiencing. And then in terms of helping, and again, this is probably following a thread that we've come through tonight, is starting with what have you found helpful? Because as you've said, Nicola, um, people, we all develop strategies to deal with our, our own weirdnesses. Um, what have you found helpful? And that's a good starting point to build on um, in, in trying to help people further. Sorry, lost the mute, but love it. Thank you, Daryl. And Valsa, some final thoughts from you? Yeah, I'll just pick on those that diagnostic issue first um, because, yeah, I wrote a paper saying um, neurodevelopmental genes haven't read the DSM criteria. And so <laughs> it doesn't behave in the way you want it to behave in, in neat pigeon holes. And that's why I said about that OCB, OCG, kind of that borderland area, many people experience both. And the reason why I would make a differentiation is only for 
management purposes because if I treat a tick OCB like an OCD, sometimes they don't find it useful because the technique is slightly different and what you need to be kind of focusing on is slightly different. And, and, the, and the same with, um, I'll give you an example, autism and social inappropriate behaviours. You know, somebody says that, you know, you take, one mom said that you take them to a, the shopping mall and you, you go, the, the kid would say, she's fat, she's fat. And, and has got to rights, you know, he would immediately kind of say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And But the damage has been done. And another kid with autism who has got social deficits and therefore doesn't know would say, she is fat. And mom says, isn't she fat? Am I not telling the truth? So you see the difference. So it's a bit like, you know, understanding where that is coming from, what the phenomenology is saying is incredibly important for, for management. So I'm, I'm not a, a stickler for the, the, the diagnostic category, as I said, I prefer saying that it, it comes as, you know, a mixed bag of everything, but for a particular person can be very important and, and, and for Ali, it would have been important as well, uh, as, as you reflect back on that kid, um, as to what is it that's kind of really the, the most important thing and where that is sitting along that spectrum of, of behaviours and phenomenology, which, is, which can help you with the management to be much more precise. Beautiful. Thank you. I mean, I think it, it's fascinating, isn't it? And I think that... The, um, everyone's been fascinated by Tourette's, often, I think, perpetuated by a lot of the myths, Elsa, that you helped um, us to, to shoot down tonight. But I think that notion of this and, right, you know, so it's a diagnostic criteria are really important and helpful for for getting the right treatment and it's the whole whole child, the whole unit, the community around the child that we that we need to consider. And siblings. We haven't even touched on siblings tonight, but you know, the the the, the differential um impacts and supports that we can have. I just really want to thank you all um, for your wisdom and um, genuine passion. It's always wonderful. You know, it's great when it goes really quickly, Daryl, and you're right, we could talk for another number of hours and we'd all be learning something still. But I really want to thank you all for your contribution and your energy and enthusiasm tonight. I want to thank everybody for joining um, this evening. It's been another wonderful MHPN webinar and I'm sure there will be... Um, there are, I know, a lot of questions that we didn't get to specifically, but I'm hoping that with the resources that are shared and the recording that's available, people can kind of dig in and, and review topics and interests. There's also a lot of love from people who know you guys on the panel and the work that you've done. So I won't go through all of that individually and embarrass you and call you out, but suffice to say that people are appreciative of the work you do in the community and they all want to come and see you. So I don't think those waiting lists are going to go down anytime soon. Um, but for those of you that have joined us tonight, thank you for taking time on a Wednesday evening at this time of the year. I know it's hard. There's lots of other demands. We would love to get your feedback. Um, there is a survey which we really appreciate. We do look at um, and really take on board in terms of uh, the content and quality of what we're producing as well as what else would be useful for you. So we would love for you to fill that out if you can. There is a pie chart icon on the lower right hand of your screen. Um, if you could do that, that would be great. It will also pop up after you're trying to, um, or as a webinar ends this evening, you'll get a statement of attendance and you'll get the resources sent out to you all this evening. Um, I'll just see what else I need to tell you about. There's another webinar coming up, as there always is, um, by Emerging Minds. My friends at Emerging Minds I've worked with really closely. Uh, practical strategies for working with children with a disability. So have a look out for that. That's on the 25th of July. On the 8th of August, we're commencing a queerobbery They've got all the good words for me to say tonight, a corroboree webinar series with Black Rainbow um, on the impact of COVID-19 on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander LGBTQI plus SB community. So keep an eye out for those notifications. There's a podcast, there's webinars coming up on alcohol and other drugs, disability and AHD in adults. Register to find out more. I feel like a, <laughs> um, a radio producer now, but there's always amazing content coming out and I'm really proud to be associated with MHPN and to, to learn from the wonderful people. Before I close and we let you all go, there's local networks. I also would like to acknowledge the pe people with the lived experience and carers 
um, who live with mental illness or other conditions and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present, thank you for your uh, participation in tonight's webinar. And thank you again to the panellists and I wish you were all and hopefully maybe over the school holidays people get a, a little bit of downtime um, and restore a little bit. Thanks again to everyone for coming along tonight. Good night.